Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast. This podcast is going to be rather special. We're going to be talking about how to achieve more in less time than you ever imagined possible. If you think about it, there's a lot of times when we sit back and we say, you know, (laughs) I wish I had more time. Everything just seems to fly off the shelf. And in this episode, we're going to be talking not so much about how to multiply your time, but how to use the time that you have more efficiently. Now, this episode has a lot of golden nuggets. My favorite is the time vampires, how they not just suck up your time, but they're draining your energy and your passion, your creativity and your business, and they're making you more and more ineffective. So we're going to be talking about how you can get rid of those and then how you can really take back control of your time the Dan Kennedy way. Now, if you've been enjoying this podcast so far, please make sure to leave a review, share this with a friend, and let's dive in. I don't think there's anybody that has had a bigger impact in the field of direct response than Dan Kennedy. The legend of Dan Kennedy should be ignored at your own peril. They're not really lessons, they're kind of laws that you live by. Dan opened my eyes to what small business marketing looks like. Dan teaches strategic direct response that is timeless. His ripple effect touches people who don't even know his name. The world as we know it was changed because Dan Kennedy became obsessed with marketing. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with your host, Dan Kennedy. Hello, everyone. This is Bill Glazer, and I'm joined by Dan Kennedy. And we're going to be your host today on the Diamond Telecoaching Call. Let's talk about today's topic. And today's topic is how to achieve more in less time than you ever imagined possible. And, uh, Dan, um, in talking about this, I'm actually tying in, like, two concepts um, that are taught in the renegade millionaire system, which is all about, you know, time integrity, but also beyond time integrity is also about achieving more in less time. And and before we get started... um, you know, the, the real purpose of the Renegade Millionaire system when you created it was all about people achieving autonomy in their lives. And so just by way of background, I want to start with that. So the first, it's a two-part question. The first part is, what is your definition of aut- autonomy? Okay, and that's, that's number one. And then how is this whole thing about achieving more and less time, how does that, how's that a great tie-in to achieving autonomy? almost a closed loop, the, um, I suppose the most used approach to defining autonomy is, uh, relative to business is being able to do business with who you want, uh, when you want, where you want, under the terms and conditions you want at the prices and fees you want. In other words, literally dictating the the rules of engagement and and while it is it is both it is outcome and benefit but it is also methodology and so the, the sort of the closed loop is um that approach is what makes it possible uh to get so much more accomplished um in so much less time than most people do because most people are not in control of the rules of engagement and therefore have their time usurped um, by people that they really shouldn't be doing business with, um, either as clients or vendors, by traveling to people instead of having people travel to them, uh, by having to go work someplace that saps their productivity, getting to or from it, you know, et cetera. Um, And then the rest of the loop is the individual who is able to get so much more accomplished in so much less time than most other people um, is able to create a lot more value, which translates into more power, which translates into the ability to dictate the rules of engagement. Uh, so there's there's a circular effect to all of this, um, and it almost doesn't matter where you start. You're you're going around the same track. Yeah, and and I'm going to be you know ask you some questions today that are specific tactics that you actually employ in order to accomplish this. And and I you know I I 
you know, and, and actually I, I believe I'm really, really good at this, but I've never seen anybody as, you know, diligent as this as you are, almost obsessively so, um, uh, as you are with this. And, and, you know, I also want to say to everybody who's listening to this call that in addition to the renegade millionaire system, uh, which, again, Dan talks a lot about this whole notion of time integrity and also about, um, you know, achieving more. Uh, another resource, if you don't have it, and you really should have it, which is going to lead me right to my next question, is Dan's book on the No BS Time Management for Entrepreneurs. Um, and so if you don't have that book, you should you should certainly grab a copy of it. It's available on you know, Amazon.com, and it's easy easy place to get it to many local bookstores, et cetera. If you're coming to the Super Conference, we'll bring a supply of them with us there that you can pick up a copy, and Dan will actually sign it for you during the book signing session. So, so you you want to that's that's another great resource for getting better at this because a commonality in in just about every entrepreneur that I've ever met is the fact that they all struggle from this topic, which is they say, gee, if I only had more time, I could get more done. And I don't think that's the solution to the problem. As a matter of fact, it's not the solution to the problem is having more time. It's just being able to use your time much more effectively. Now, moving into my next question, Dan, about this, and again, I'm taking this right out of your book. In your book, you've identified a term that you call time vampires. And I'd like you to, for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, can you sort of explain what you mean by time vampires? And then also uh, talk about how that sort of really does what you call it is a, is a vampire of people's time. So, God, I'll just turn it over to you. I've done a good enough job stumbling over that question. <laughs> well, I, it, it, the vampire analogy is because they, they don't just suck up time. They literally drain you of energy and lifeblood. And so, you know, the sales professional who is spending too much of his time with poorly qualified or poorly prepared prospects, um, you know, is 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 not only living a a unproductive existence, which is directly reflected in income and bank account balance but he's living literally a soul draining existence and you know over time uh, it, it makes him increasingly ineffective um, and the income continues to diminish rather than improve uh, the business owner who is spending an inordinate amount of his time uh, dealing with recalcitrant and uncooperative and unmotivated employees, uh, poorly performing vendors, um, uh, activities that don't relate directly to sales, profits, achieving his goals. Again, he's not only unproductive, he's being drained of his entrepreneurial energy and creativity and, and, and passion for his business. And you see a lot of these people uh, you know, literally walking around like zombies. You know, their skin's a little gray, their eyes are a little dull. Uh, 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 you know, they don't have a lot of pep to them. And, and that's what's happened to them. And so protecting yourself from that, I think, is just critical. Uh, the, the list of time vampires is, you know, as long as a list can be. Some are, are quite universal. Everybody experiences them. Others can be relatively unique to someone's personal existence or type of business. And I think most people are extremely reluctant to, um, to rid themselves of them, even when they are aware of them. Um, for a variety of bad reasons. Um, the idea that, you know, the devil I've got is better than the devil I don't know, the difficulty of replacing someone, um, the, uh, the, the fear of firing a client and not having sufficient deal flow to replace that client. Um, 
you know, all of these reasons that cause people to be generously tolerant of time vampires. Um, you really start all the way over there and you fix those reasons. So, you know, if you think about, for example, tolerating bad clients, why, why does somebody tolerate bad clients or bad customers? Well, because they don't have enough flow coming to them of good clients or good customers. So if you go and you fix that, which is really a marketing problem, uh, then you have you are emboldened uh, to do a better job of protecting yourself from the time vampire of the bad client or the bad customer. Similarly, you can sort of trace every time vampire being tolerated back to a a cause uh, that is in that is within your control that you can go fix so that you don't have to tolerate them. Um, but uh, most people, their lives are incredibly populated by them. And, and, of course, there's not just human time vampires. There's technology time vampires. There's situational time va- vampires. Um, and so, you know, most people are winding up at the end of their business day uh, drained and then they sort of put themselves back together again and and go through the exact same blood draining experience the next day and uh, that's not a very good cycle i had it at its very worst for a very brief period of time many years ago when i took over a company with a lot of employees and a lot of problems and uh, i very idiotically um attempted what at the time was very popular and was called open door management. And um, it, 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 it was a, a very bad idea. Um, and it didn't take me very long to figure out that it was a very bad idea, however noble it may have sounded or popular it may have been in the management uh, a lit- literature of the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually shocked to hear you admit that you even did it for a short period of time because... Um, oh, no, no. I ceremoniously took the door off the office and nailed it to the wall next to the office. And, I mean, that's just suicidal. Yeah. Well, damn near. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if, you, if, you can't, if anybody came to the Glazer County office, which I'm not inviting anybody to do that, but if anybody came <laughs> to the Glazer County office and there's, there's two doors that are leading into my office, I mean, they are closed all the time and there's do not disturb signs in front of both of them. So um, it's totally inefficient. And, you know, I, I think people are just, you know, they're, a lot of people conduct their business affairs essentially out of fear. So fear of what others will think of them, fear of losing a deal because they weren't immediately accessible, fear of an employee screwing something up momentously because they couldn't get to them instantaneously to ask them a question. And, and so, really, they are, they are literally, I mean, they're not like physically standing quaking, uh, but they are operating in fear. And the results of that are never very good. You mentioned that people are very intolerant of all this, allowing these time vampires and bad behavior. Do you think it's because of the fear factor? Yeah. Yeah, I think people are. Uh, just anxious of mostly negatively imagined consequences mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. beginning to, you know, impose their their will mm-hmm. and write their rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they really, you know, are not in governance. Mm-hmm. And And as a result, there's a direct link to both personal productivity, actually to organizational productivity, mm-hmm. um, and to, um, you know, how they feel about what they're doing mm-hmm. over time. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, one of the uh, commonalities that I see most entrepreneurs have is is the slowness that they 
rid themselves of the unproductive or destructive employee. And, you know, and many of them will allow them to linger and hang on forever. And uh, sometimes I've seen some potentially reason for why you let somebody linger on for a time. But I actually think that the main reason is, is because they look at the whole process of having to now go and recruit, interview, hire, and train a new replacement employee to them is more painful than having to actually uh, live with the bad one that they got. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's it's not much different than, you know, keeping a dog around that craps on the carpet all the time. Uh, I, I mean, you're familiar with the dog. You know the dog, the devil you know, and maybe the one you get is not only going to crap on the carpet, but he's going to chew up the chair and I got to go find a new dog, and I got to train a new dog, so I'll just tolerate this dog. Uh, but you know that that sort of frames the whole thing as an either-or situation of evils, which ought not be the case. Specific to a management situation, it, it, we know that uh, it's extremely dangerous to be in that position in the first place, where any one person is indispensable um, in manufacturing you learn to cross train so everybody can do everybody else's jobs um, in many businesses in sales the single account executive relationship with client has been replaced by team relationship with client so any one given salesperson can be shot at any given time and there's not disruption I mean so there are you know strategic ways to deal with that specific management issue. But the overall tolerance of all of it is pretty much is often for exactly the same reason is that the the aftermath of doing what is obviously necessary um, is so unappealing or there's quote no time to do it that the bad situation that is damaging to productivity and draining of energy continues to be tolerated and procrastinated over. Um, specific to management, I think, and I'm sure you would agree, there's also people who, you know, are very reluctant to make these changes out of out of uh, 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 the out of blind hope that somehow somebody's going to fix themselves. Um, out of loyalty, out of gee, Mary's got three kids and her husband doesn't pay his child support kind of knowledge. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why we let people hang around who ought not be there. Um, And I think even, which some of that's dealt with in the time management book you referred to, I think a lot of this even goes all the way back to not really having a sense of how much Every hour and every minute of your time has to be worth in order to achieve your goals and what key people's time has to be worth in order to achieve your goals. So there's not really enough pressure to protect it because it's not viewed as a financial expenditure to start with. And so people tend to be you know, much more wary of the spending of their money uh, than they do the spending of their time. So so I think people, and I'm going to ask you to be brief on this answer, although um, you you probably, it really deserves a longer answer than I'm going to ask you to give, because, but I have some other questions I want to make sure I get to on, on this call. But I think I think people would be very very interested in sort of seeing some of your own personal behavior in terms of how you were able to manage your time so well in order to get so much done. So, and, and maybe maybe even lead with some of the idiosyncrasies of some of the stuff that, which you obviously don't consider them to be that, but but as others would consider them to be idiosyncrasies. Well, I, look, I suppose the biggest overriding thing is that um, that basically you know I don't necessarily like to work so if I am going to work by God I want to 
squeeze every ounce of juice there is out of that hour's lemon. And so that makes me very resistant to having any of it wasted. Um, So, you know, like today for me is a phone day. So the entire day from 7 o'clock this morning until 7 o'clock tonight is all pre-scheduled phone activity. Uh, There's private coaching calls in 20-minute increments. There's this call. There's some time with you after the call. Uh, There was a radio interview. There's various and sundry things, the commonality all being that they all happen on the phone. And the other commonality being that there's going to be, despite almost all of it being scheduled back-to-back with no breaks, there are going to be breaks because some people can't tell time. Uh, some people can't tell time if there's a time zone difference. And some people can't manage to show up when they're supposed to show up anywhere, period. So there's a guarantee there's going to be in a day, somebody's going to miss a phone appointment altogether. Um, somebody's going to be five minutes late. Somebody's going to need to leave five minutes early, etc. Well, I have work to do that can be done in that kind of interrupted manner so that I use those five minutes and the 20 minutes or 30 minutes that somebody misses altogether um, rather than sitting around twiddling my thumbs or fuming. Um, And it doesn't sound like much, but, you know, 10 minutes captured every day is 3,000 and some odd minutes in a year, and that's a significant little chunk of money when you equate the minutes to money. And I think most people, you know, are are more casual about uh, the way their time is used and all of that. Most people don't even have end times for what they do. They only have start times. Um, And so phone calls, for example, with me, I mean, they end when they end uh, based on pre-agreement, not based on how long somebody wants to talk. And everybody knows it. Um, The idiosyncrasy stuff, um, as you say. Actually, before before you get to the idiosyncrasies, I mean, the, the first answer to the question would fall in that category. <laughs> well, see, it doesn't, see, yeah, well, as you pointed out, see, it doesn't seem weird to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, a, because it, it's a modus operandi that hasn't really changed in many, many years. So, I mean, I'm very used to it. <laughs> right, right. And, 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 you know, it doesn't seem strange to me at all. It just seems like common sense. But I mean, um, but... But, but, like, for example, one of the things that people find the most fascinating about our relationship, our working relationship, is the fact that we have a pre-scheduled monthly call for us to talk. I mean, they, they find that amazing, you know. And we've been doing it for seven years, and it's worked terrific for us. And it's, I mean, we get more done in that time, that hour or hour and a half that we talk than one would get, any, you know, any other two people would get done in a weekend. You know, and uh, because it's you know it's very figured out in advance, and it works really well. But now, so now that you've said that those aren't idiosyncrasies, what are some of the idiosyncrasies? Well, um, I uh, you know it's a very hard question because nothing really seems obviously strange to me. Um, um, I mean, I. Um, I, I, I I really like our call. I mean, I really sort of rein in and control and impose organization on all the communication I have with everybody. And on the rare occasion that, you know, that's not going to work out for somebody, um, you know, I'm and the relationship. Um, And so one of the biggest differences I observe between me and most is that 
I get to do almost all my work activity, regardless of what category it is in, without interruption or disruption. And that compression of time um, and concentrated effort on a given task really does essentially give you more time. It multiplies time because almost everybody else is is hop, skipping, and jumping uh, a, a whole lot. And so if I'm writing, all I'm doing is writing. I mean, I'm not checking email. I'm not answering the phone. I'm not making a phone call. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing any of that. Uh, I'm writing. If I'm on the phone, I'm on the phone. Um, it, almost without exception, be they vendors, uh, tomorrow I got a bank manager, they come to me. I don't schlep around going to other people because it, it just, it, it's so incredibly time inefficient. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, people forget where they're supposed to be and don't get there on time and, you know, all of those sorts of things. So better I should be working. Um, and so I'm just, you know, your word was obsessive. Um, I mean, I micromanage it and micromanage everybody's um, interaction so as to uh, avoid them interfering with it. Um, I'm also I, I'm also amused that people don't. I mean, I'm quite capable of disconnecting the phone altogether for some period of time, and you know that has always driven people crazy. I mean, people used to get out of the bathtub to go answer their landlines. Um, I, I assume now they take their cell phone with them to the bathtub. I don't know, but that would be my assumption. Um, and, and, and so people just like live by the disruption and the interruption and the constant connectivity, uh, whereas I live very much in, in the opposite way. So moving back to the renegade millionaire system for a second, one of the exercises that you have in the back of the manual <clears throat> is you talk about iron force strategies used to safeguard your time and productivity. And you actually ask people to list those out. Um, um, I guess the question is, is, is talk about that as far as these, these iron for, fortress, iron, I hope I said fortress, iron fortress strategies, like what would you consider are some, some good ones to have and, and maybe what are some bad ones that people do have? Well, I mean, I, I think, for example, you know, control of place, um, um, and work environment and situations. So, you know, when Trump started to do The Apprentice, um, a big issue was where they were going to film it. And a absolute deal breaker for him was having the boardroom scene, which takes a lot longer to film than what we see on TV. I mean... I believe, if I remember what he said correctly, that that that's like three hours. So a deal breaker for him was that they had to put a boardroom studio in Trump Tower <laughs> so he could just come down in a back elevator and come in there and do it. And if they were going to take a 20-minute break, he could get in the elevator and go back up to his office and do something. He didn't want it in a studio somewhere else. And... You know, that's control of place. Um, I mean, I, so like I, I'm not quite as rigid about it as I used to be, but almost without exception, I write for at least 30 minutes every morning on my stuff. And so if I'm working at a seminar that is here, and is at a hotel no more than 20 minutes from my house, um, I can still get my coffee, come down to my office in my morning, and I can do my half an hour uh, without, you know, having to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and 
or be otherwise massively inconvenienced. If that thing is in another city, all bets are off. So I think control of place is a big one. For salespeople, control of selling situation, you know, is a big one. Um, and uh, and again, I, I think most people, you know, aren't very good about that. Um, I think control of the way uh, people interact. So as you say, we're efficient, um, you and I, and have been for seven years. So scheduled call, um, certainly... You know, nine one one emergency stuff when it when it has to be. Although generally in both directions, me to you, you to me, that's a fax, and it's not uh, a common occurrence. Um, I mean, not way back. You know, when I took the door back off the wall and put it back on my office, having discovered that open door management was a bad idea. You know, I switched to everybody having either depending on who they were, once a day, one every two days, twice a week, here's your 15 minutes of quality time, and it's a predetermined appointment start and end, and you better have all your shit organized because at the 15th minute it's over whether we've dealt with your eight crises or not. Um, in a short period of time, everybody who didn't have to be fired uh, got in gear with that, and it worked fine. Uh, clients, same way. So I think you can't protect your time and your productivity unless you are able to uh, to define how people are going to work with you, interact with you, communicate with you, and get them to understand that process and adhere to it. So so um I I'm, I would I would say that everybody that's listening to this right now I would um uh, go back to the Renegade Millionaire system and get that manual out in the back you will see that exercise that talks about the iron fortress strategies used to safeguard your time or productivity. And I would say that you fill that out, give some thought to it. Uh, you might even uh, want to uh, get some input from even some of the people that you work with as far as how they would identify that for you um, or what you, what you actually do right now and also what you're not doing right now. And so, like, like as I said, you know, where's the holes in, in, in that Iron Fortune strategies? What are the things that you're not doing? that you probably should be doing. Um, you know, the point about that is yeah. this is not about, you know, being a diva. Um, this is about presuming that you are a highly valuable person performing high-value things. Then this is about making sure that you can do that with the greatest effectiveness possible. I mean, I look at what we do to try and optimize the performance of a racehorse. And if you compare it to what most people don't do to try and optimize their own performance, um, it's stark. Everything from you know, diet, nutrition, exercise, physical health, to to physical environment, to mood, uh, to to place. I mean, some horses, for example, prefer a stall at the front of the barn where there's a lot of activity. Others prefer a stall at the back of the barn where they're left alone and not bothered. Since they can't tell us that, we have to figure that out for them. But it matters, and physical environment matters for a human performing as well. Now, I happen to believe you should be able to perform at your best under the worst possible circumstances, but that doesn't mean you ought to be putting yourself to that test on a day-to-day basis. So I think, you know, when you just said discuss this with people around you, 
I mean, I, I definitely believe that your key people, including not just staff, but like vendors you keep, um, even clients, if you're in a client environment that you work for, have to be made to understand that everybody's best interests are served uh, by Bill being able to perform what Bill does um, at at the best possible level. And everybody's really in that game and ought to be supportive of that. You know, i tell you that at first uh, people will react poorly to that idea and also they'll make they'll make sort of snide little comments to you about it or comments to others about it it's not at first i've been getting them for 30 years <laughs> well at first when when the person is who's new to this is exposed to it right um that's what i mean by at first and you know and like you know i'll have many people that are used to and let's just say they are there are big names in our space, uh, and they are used to being able to pick up the phone and just talking to the other person. And um, and they are challenged by the fact that you can't just talk to me. You got to actually uh, usually phone or email my assistant, and she, and she sets up a time when I talk to them, um, and they got to wait until I got a time that's available for them. But so again, at first that that is something that they are they don't react well to but after you sort of they understand that that's how the game is played um like dan said uh, they actually do eventually enjoy that and like dan said which is even more important um they got their their ducks in a row so they use the time very wisely so they're not just schmoozing for a period of time uh, they realize that they got to get to the point pretty quickly so it's a much more productive time and i think there's I think there's a time to socialize with folks, and there's a time to for business. And uh, but at the business, you you know you got to be as productive as you possibly can. So you got to really manage the amount of socializing time that you do have. I, I will also say, to Dan's point about his open door policy, which Dan I never have used. Now I've never been as 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 rigid about it as I was until I met. What I can, what my Dan Kennedy in management. So the guy's name was Vince Rapoli, and he was the one that uh, you know, first taught me the whole issue of that. You know, figure out who are the people that report directly to you. Have a pre-scheduled meeting with them one-on-one -on -one each week, and with a certain amount of time that's scheduled for it, with a specific agenda, and, and sort of train them throughout the week, like you did with your 15-minute um, meetings, Dan, where they come with their list of stuff that. They're prepared to discuss. I actually take it a step further, which is when they leave the meeting, they're leaving with a list of, of accomplishments with deadlines. So when they come back, when we meet with them the next week, they're reporting back to me. They're going down the list, actually. They're leaving with an actual list. They're going back to the list and reporting to me what they've accomplished on that list to their deadlines, and then they have time to, and I as well as I do, to bring up new topics that we need to discuss. And then, again, at the end of that meeting, they're leaving with 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 a yet a new list, and as I said, my doors are closed with do not disturb, and they know, like Dan talked about the nine one one issues that he and I will usually fax back and forth, and on a rare occasion, if it's a real the fire is burning bright, one of us has picked up the phone, but I can count on one hand how often that's happened over seven years where one of us had to do that to the other. Um, so with the same thing with these folks. Um, they um, they have to, on a rare occasion, if there's a fire burning in Glazer Kennedy and they've got to um, say to my assistant, Sherry, gee, I really need to talk to Bill as soon as I can, they they do have the right to do that. And, but they've got to, they can't, that's like a get out of jail free card. If they start abusing that, they're going to lose that and they know that. But But that has really, really, really served the growth of all my businesses. So when I created the menswear two menswear stores where were two of the top most successful menswear stores in the United States. That's how that was a big factor in that big growth of that and, and the Glazer Kennedy growth over the last seven years that we've had, you know, mega 
growth at, at, at Glazer Kennedy. That's a big factor in that is is managing your people most effectively. And my definition of management, which is a big part about this whole thing about time management and also about extreme productivity, my definition of management is getting things done through others. So I don't want people to think in listening to this that everybody can do everything themselves. That's not a smart use of your time. And like Dan said, knowing what your time is worth. And I can, I, I know Dan, I mean, I know exactly what I'm worth an hour. I'm really, I got that number that's nailed, you know, and I know you've got that as well. And so, that, and that's a really smart number to work to with, is is every time you're looking at a task, saying to yourself, am I now best to be doing that task, or am I better off getting this done through others, and whereas I'm better off spending my time on the most productive task, uh, which is, which is which is now realizing what my time is actually worth. And if you're not having that number, damn it, you better get that number. Because that is, that is really a game changer in figuring out how you actually do stuff. Um, I'm going to open know, the, up. The bigger ahead. that number, too, or the bigger you want that number to be, the easier it is to get so far behind you can't catch up. So it, it makes it really incumbent upon you not to waste much or let much be wasted. And, you know, the inverse of this, like if you go on QVC to sell something, they know exactly how many dollars per minute you have to generate in order to get a return engagement in a slightly better time slot and then get a return engagement in a slightly better time slot and ultimately move up the ladder to be, <coughs> excuse me, a reoccurring primetime player because their whole business is based on turning a finite number of broadcast minutes into the maximum number of dollars. So it's very clear uh, they know by 9.05 in the morning if they're ahead or behind, they know by noon if they're ahead or behind. The person selling is being told through an earpiece in their ear whether they're ahead or behind on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and, and they have to be because if they were casual about it at all, by the end of the first week of the year, they could be so far behind they'd never catch up for the rest of the year. And most people don't have that kind of clarity, um, which, as you just pointed out, you and I do, about what the time has to be worth and its relationship to where we are trying to arrive in financial terms. Uh, most people don't have that kind of clarity. However, it is my observation that people way at the top do, um, that seven-figure earners do. I mean, you do not I mean, uh, I've had a relationship with Greg Ranker or Guthrie Ranker for 30 years. I can't pick up the phone and call him. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get his assistant, and we're going to get a scheduled time. Now, I imagine if I told that assistant, you know, I'm, I've only got an hour to live, and the doctor's standing here by my bedside, and I want to tell him something, chances are I could get him on the phone. But... Short of that, no. And I doubt hardly anybody just picks up the phone and calls Trump. Um, I, I, I rather doubt it. Um, and, and so I know from having a few conversations with Iacocca how he worked when he ran Chrysler. And, you know, God saved the soul who just showed up at the door of the office. Um, and so if you want to be a top performer, you have to start running things like a top performer before, even before you are a top performer. And, you know, and first of all, that, that, that last sentence you said takes a lot of courage for people to actually buy into that um, because, you know, they're, they're, they're so afraid that they're going to miss an opportunity by, by doing that. But the truth of the matter is that they'll actually make more opportunity for themselves by doing that. But, but the, uh, 
But the other thing I would say, which is one of the biggest tenets to the whole renegade millionaire system, which is why people struggle with buying into what you just said, is that they are, you know, very, very concerned about being criticized by others. And one of the commonalities of the renegade millionaire system is the immunity to criticism. So there's no, I mean, even my friends, which is really crazy, my friends complain to me about the fact how inaccessible I am to them. You know, they want to be able to call me on my cell phone and talk to me any time of day or night. And, and, and there's times that I will take their calls on my cell phone. There's, most of the time I don't even have a cell phone with me. But I can't take my calls, and which also bothers the hell out of them that they can't just reach me. But, but you've got to just be immune to it because if not, you just won't get done what you want to get done. Um, the, the quickest, the, the surest way to please a lot of people in life is to be unproductive and unsuccessful. Um, <laughs> you, you'll 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 be loved, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but uh, uh, but you know that's about all. Well, and you know, and and you and what you'll be loved by is the is the fellow unproductive, unsuccessful person. Yeah. So so what happens is is they want to bring you down to their level. You know. Um, uh, once again, you know, you know, when I when I go uh, think back to like high school, okay, so like I had friends in high school because in high school I had a different agenda, you know, it wasn't about being an entrepreneur, right? So I had a lot of friends in high school, and now fast forward, well, some of those people I'm still friendly with, but they're not like they don't they don't have the entrepreneurial mindset that I do. So some of them do, and I really enjoy hanging out with them, and I enjoy talking entrepreneur with entrepreneurship with them. But the ones that don't have that entrepreneur mindset, I hate talking to them about business because they want to bring me down to their level, you know. And and they, they're actually, or in many cases, although they don't cognitively realize it, they're like jealous of the success that I've enjoyed so that they don't want to, they want to now bring me down to the level where they wouldn't be jealous of it. Then and, and that's, so that, which is another, another big concept in a renegade millionaire system is, the whole who do you associate with and the, the litmus test that you have for who you actually associate with. And, and there's different people that you associate with is what my belief is, but you associate with them in different ways. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. Um, I guess one more thing, and then I'll open up to questions. Um, so in the back of the manual, there's, there's, this, um, there's this exercise you have, which I encourage everybody to do, which is the Iron Fortress Strategies used to safeguard your time and productivity. And then the next exercise that's a follow-up to that is where's the hole in your fortresses? But then also back there, and by the way, it's probably a bunch of people that are listening to this right now, and they're saying to themselves, gee, I own the Renegade Million System. I haven't looked at it in a while, you know? And I would advise everybody to go back and minimally listen to the CDs again, uh, probably multiple times. But but also, Better yet, do the exercises. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's true, which is where I'm getting through right yeah. now. There, there's an exercise, which you're actually right. Better yet, do the damn exercises, because they're actually much more, uh, they, will, they will produce a much better result for you than listening to the CDs, because they'll bring it to consciousness to you where your strengths are and where it needs to be worked, and where the places that need to be worked on, which is now getting to the last exercise, which is, really interesting exercise, and I guarantee you that I don't think anybody on this call has ever done this exercise that's in this book, maybe one or two, but very few, which is in the back there, you've got this exercise, which is the 15-minute time block the diary. Yeah. And, um, and I, used to get, I used to give that exercise to every manager uh, in my men's wear stores and to every sales associate in my men's wear stores. And I will tell you a little story about that. So I used to give it to them. I used to tell them to do it for a week, okay? And and then they would, at the end of the week, they would turn it in to me. And the first time they, they when they turned it in to me, they always did a crappy job with filling it out. They were just way too broad in how they filled it out. So And I knew that was going to happen. So then at the end of the week, I handed it back to them. I said, now go do it for another week. You know, I need much more specifics. So I, I never really got a good result until the second week because because they needed to, think they were going to fool me on the first week and so and so now 
I would advise everybody, I know it's a pain in the neck. This is a horrible thing to have to do. I can tell you that right off the bat. But I advise everybody to be very diligent about it, and only the really, truly successful people that are listening to this call was ever going to actually do this. The real, real ultra-successful folks, I guess the really the true renegade millionaires, will ever do this. But I'm telling you something. You fill it out, okay, and you do a really good job of filling it out, and at the end of the week, you go back and look at it, you're going to be finding a lot of places there that are time vampires or things that you're doing that others should be doing that are going to cost a lot less for them to be done. So it, it's a tremendous exercise, and I highly encourage everybody to do that. Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with Dan Kennedy. If you love hearing in on these lost Dan Kennedy talks and speeches and calls, then please let someone else know about this podcast. That's how you can help it to grow. And the more it grows, the more free Dan Kennedy we can bring to you. Also, Dan would love to give you the most incredible free gift ever designed to help you make maximum money in minimum time. Now, this free gift comes with almost $20,000 in pure money-making information for free just for saying maybe. You can get this gift from Dan right now at nobsletter.com. Not only will you get the $20,000 gift, you also need a subscription to two marketing newsletters that will be hand-delivered by the mailman to your mailbox each and every month, one from Dan Kennedy and one from me, Russell Brunson. To get this gift and your subscription, go to nobsletter.com right now.